Welcome to Logos Live. My name is Robert Martin, the director of the City Bible Forum here in Melbourne, and I'm your host for the show. Logos is Greek for word or message, and Logos Live seeks to engage the Christian message before a live audience at lunchtime in the CBD of Melbourne. And do we have a live audience here today? Are they alive? Is there a couple of... Yes, there's... We also aim to have a little bit of fun. Who said exploring the big questions of life shouldn't be enjoyable? Now, modern Australian culture is influenced heavily by Christianity. The Christian message dominates the history of Western civilization, and the birth of Christianity can be traced to that first Easter week. It's known as the week that changed the world. And today, we're speaking with someone who does believe in the Easter story, the Reverend Tracy Lawson. Now, Tracy is the Associate Vicar of St. Hilary's Anglican Church in Kew, and is the director of the Peter Corney Training Centre. Formerly in the corporate training field, she has worked in school chaplaincy and for various churches. And Tracy is also the recipient of the Victoria's Premier's Award for Excellence in Multicultural Affairs for her work in developing a Sudanese refugee tutoring program. Please now welcome Tracy Lawson. Yep, come up here. Yep. Well, welcome, you. Tracy. I'm glad that you could join us here today. Thank you. Now, you've been working in a church for a long time and have been a Christian believer for many years. Can you tell us what convinced you to become a Christian in the first place? Great question. Uh, I, when I was a teenager, a friend at school invited me along to her church, her youth group, and I went there uh, from time to time over a number of years. Um, I also made a friend there who was at my school as well, and she kept following me up like she'd keep inviting me to stuff so if she was I had a bit annoying was she she was a bit annoying <laughs> at times um, and uh, so if I hadn't been to church for a while she'd invite me back and I mean this went on for about six years right. she was very persistent um, she was very successful I have to say I'm, I'm the godmother of her daughter and uh, we've been solid friends for decades and decades but at the time she was just someone who um, cared enough to keep inviting me in to hear the message about Jesus and on one of those occasions um, I did go and hear with her a preacher who was preaching from a passage in the Old Testament Psalm 51 mm -hmm. it's a psalm about um, a king who does some terrible things and he's asking God to forgive him and as the preacher preached from this passage I think even though I'd been in and out of church for many years was a real penny dropping moment for me to comprehend what sin was that the king who was praying this prayer that's recorded in the bible had done something terrible and that god actually has a standard the king hadn't achieved it and as i reflected on my own life i thought you know i have to acknowledge that the life i am living is not one that god would be happy with and then the flip side to that is the forgiveness that's offered in Jesus Christ and this incredible fresh start. And even way back you know, when the King writes this, long before Christ came, it's, it's claiming a forgiveness that is made available in Jesus. And I think having heard this, I just it struck me. I thought, well, I, I actually understand this and I think it's all true and I've got to make a choice. And I realise that if I, even if I make no choice, that's a choice in itself to walk away from from what I understand. So uh, I went back to my home, I was living in Canberra at the time, and prayed a prayer to God that he would forgive me. And uh, then I rang my friend who was living in Sydney and I said, come down next weekend and help me to find a church. Wow. Um, I was about, I was in my early 20s at this stage and I think because I'd become a Christian, come to faith in Jesus as an adult and I hadn't grown up in a Christian family, I grew up in a wonderful family, but not a believing family. And I was just struck with how little I knew about the God that I'd put my faith in. So pretty quickly I got this idea that I could take myself off to Bible college and right. study for a few years. And I did that about a year and a half later. And here it's we all go. Boots I, and all. That's you right. Know, boots <laughs> and all. You want to make right. a decision. So it wasn't simply that you made the decision to appease your friend. Oh, well, finally, I'll just do it to, to get her off my back. No, but I'm grateful for her persistence. And uh, it actually encourages me when I, you know, invite my friends to church and they go, no. And I think in my mind, that's such a big deal. In their mind, they've forgotten it in half an hour, you know. That <laughs> <laughs> so I'll keep being persistent. Right, okay. <laughs> Easter, it's described as the week that changed the world. How has it changed you? As I said, I, I put my faith in Jesus and then it struck me, I thought, I hardly know Jesus, I hardly know God who I've committed myself to. And I, I was reading in the New Testament, there's a verse that says, be holy for I am holy, speaking about God and God expecting 
people to accurately reflect his image and to live a holy life. And I thought, well, I don't even really understand what this means. And um, if I spend a lifetime just going to church once a fortnight and I add up all those 20-minute sermons, it's going to take me a lifetime to understand this. So that's why I, I thought I'll, I'll go to college. And <laughs> you could go somewhere that preaches longer sermons, perhaps. That's yeah. right. <laughs> I'll fast-track this. That's right, yeah, that's right. That, that's, yeah. and, and so I've ended up in ministry, but even as I... That wasn't my original plan. And at the time that I was studying, I thought, it doesn't matter what I do after this. This, will, this is giving me what I need for life. This is equipping me to understand what it means to live a faithful life to Jesus, um, what it means for Jesus to transform your life. So it was great. Yeah. Well, the theme we're considering today is justice. What do you make of justice? What is justice? Well, I love justice. I think justice is about... What do you love about justice? Well, I was, I was thinking about this this morning. I thought justice. And I remembered last uh, year we went on holidays and we took ourselves to The Hague and visited right. uh, <laughs> and, and looked at... You were just wanting to get into some war crimes or something. Uh, right? well, you love that kind of thing for a holiday. It, we, were, we were nearby and so we, we took this day trip and we saw this amazing place called the Peace Palace um, in The Hague, which arbitrates between nations that are in disagreement and it's an incredible place. And um, I think justice is about fairness, it's about rightness, it's about what's correct, it's about people getting what they deserve and the law systems that we have are a mechanism to ensure that people do get what they deserve and that their rights are upheld. It seems to be an inherent human trait to want justice. We feel aggrieved if we don't receive justice. Why do you think that we want justice? Yes, it, it does seem inbuilt and I have two daughters who have an incredibly acute sense of justice. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you buy one for one of them, the other one, you know, demands, fairness requires that you buy something for them as well, yes, for example. Yes. Um, so it's definitely innate and uh, theologically I suppose we would say that that came from the fact that we are we're creatures, we've been created that we actually reflect the image to some extent of the one who made us. And so if the one who made us, if one of their attributes is that they are just, that they are fair, that they are right, then it's natural that that will be inbuilt in us as well. And our love of stories where justice is served shows how much we love it as well. Well, speaking of stories where justice is served, courtroom dramas. Are you a fan of the courtroom drama? I don't watch a lot of TV. I do recall watching Judge Judy sometimes right, okay. in the afternoon. <laughs> I, th I think it used to show in the afternoon when I got home from school. Right. And uh, that was it was like really, it seemed like quickly delivered justice. Easy right, justice okay. actually. Um, which was terrific. I always used to get Judge Judy confused with Punch and Judy. Oh. I realise that's very different. Yeah, anyway, yeah. yeah. But I love <laughs> the movies, um, The Untouchables, that movie about Al Capone getting what he deserved mm -hmm. in a really quirky way. Like he was charged not for all the terrible things he'd done. They got him on a tax evasion yeah. charge. But that was a fantastic movie. Elliot Ness, you know, you just wanted him to win in the courtroom. Mm. And uh, the movie A Few Good Men, yeah. you know, where the two Marines are charged with murdering another Marine. And... Um, What's called one of the classic, all-time classic Fantastic, courtroom yeah. scenes. You know, I want the truth. Yeah, yeah. You, you can't handle the truth. That's right, it's yeah, great. That's right. yeah. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Erin Brockovich, you know, yep. the single mum lawyer who brings about justice uh, in the environmental law. Yep. Um, and, uh, yeah, I love movies like that. Yep. Legally Blonde. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's got another great courtroom it's scene. bringing up <laughs> images <laughs> of stilettos and chihuahuas. Yeah, that's mind. right. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, there's yeah. also a great courtroom scene. So do you think that this, what, this is what courtroom dramas tap, tap into, our innate sense of wanting justice? Yeah, absolutely. They tap into that. And it's interesting because very few of us will find ourselves in a court case in our lifetime. Mm. But, but it seems to capture everything we think about when we think about justice. Mm. Yeah. Well, today we're thinking about the trial of Jesus. It's a bit of a, a form of a courtroom drama in some sense, with a bit of a twist. Uh, but before we consider that part of the Bible, I'd like to introduce someone. Some say that he invented Twitter as a way of encouraging short, comedic, poetic forms. It's true. Yeah. But actually, not very many people say that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All we know is he's Cam, award-winning poet and performer. Please welcome Cam Simmons. 
this trial that we're looking at today really only makes sense in the broader context or doesn't make sense at all in the broader context. So I thought I'd do a really brief autobiography of, no, not an autobiography, a biography of Jesus. <laughs> uh, just, of yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you Side claiming complex. to be the Messiah? <laughs> yeah. Um, I call this piece The Life and Death and Life of Christ. A Mary, a Joseph, a Christmas, a long time ago. An angel appears, an announcement made, a miracle. In Mary's womb, a gift from God, a baby, a boy. Time passes, a toddler, a teenager, a man, a prayer, a worker, a carpenter. His time arrives, a desert, a solitude, a testing, a real beginning. Jesus, a body healer, a sin forgiver, a kingdom preacher, a toucher of the sick, a friend of the hated, an insider for the outsider, a table turner, a water walker, a storm calm. A finder of the lost, a firster of the last, a lover of the least, a giver of life to others, a giver of life his own, a kiss, a betrayal, a trial, a farce, a lie, another, another, stripping, whipping, ripping lies. A sham, a silence, a conviction, a cross, a nail, a thorn, a crown, a cry. It is finished. A death, a tomb, a rock, a day. Another, another, an emptiness, a hopelessness, a stirring, a rolling, an opening, Jesus, an emptying, a hope, an angel, a proclamation, the Lord is arisen. Faith, a hope, a love, a salvation. Amen. So, that's my little overview of the life of Christ. So it's uh, Luke chapter 23, uh, going from verses 13 through to verses 25. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Now, wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. But they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time, he spoke to them. Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified. And their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. Tracy, your thoughts, reactions to Cam's poetry there? Yeah, I love that there, there were kind of a couple of beginnings and... Um, a number of things that 
Cam was talking about uh, things we re we have to read between the lines of scripture to find them, like Jesus, his childhood, his adolescence, and those sorts of things. Um, so that was lovely, and it, it was a Twitter esque, very speedy <laughs> summary of um, Jesus from birth through death through resurrection. As I was listening to a lot of what Cam was saying about Jesus, the healings and the compassion and so on, and I'm thinking from the perspective of trial, you listen to that description of the man and you think it's impossible to understand why he was killed on that basis. You know, from our perspective, we think this was a great man. Yeah. This was a miracle worker, um, you know, and yet, and yet he was so hated uh, by the Jewish leaders and condemned to, to die on a cross. So maybe we'll just think a little bit about this section here. Jesus has been arrested by the religious leaders, taken to Pontius Pilate, who's not an aeroplane pilot I've discovered, uh, but the governor of the region. And the passage sort of has three elements, doesn't it? There's the charge, the trial, and then the punishment. So the charge against him, this was brought by the religious leaders. Why would they want him dead? As, as you've said, like, he was so good did so many amazing things, why would they want him dead? Mm, he was an incredible threat to them and it's interesting the charges that are brought against him. They say when they take him to Pilate that he has subverted the nation, opposed payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. Now what they were really concerned about was his claim to be Messiah and the Messiah was literally the anointed one um, but the common phrase for the Messiah was king. It was the person, uh, king descended from King David's line um, that was, and they were, ex they were waiting on um, a king that God would send to free them. Mm -hmm. um, so when Jesus comes and he claims to be the Messiah, that's an incredible, it's an incredible claim. Um, they reject his claim and they want to get rid of him because he is creating so much trouble for them. And he is, he's questioning um, and, and accusing them of not actually living lives that God would be happy with and not serving him at all. So he's an incredible threat to the Jewish leaders. But when they bring him to Pilate, they add in these extra charges. He's subverting the nation and he opposes payment of taxes to Caesar. Now that's entirely inaccurate. Um, and if you just flick back in the chapter, they had sent someone to say to him, uh, you know, they'd shown him a, they'd said, you know, do you agree we should pay taxes to Caesar? And he had said, show me a coin. And on it was a picture of Caesar. And he said, give to Caesar what is Caesar. So Jesus, actually, when he was asked about paying taxes, um, had said we ought to pay mm -hmm. our taxes. So it's, it's, um, it's very false. Uh, it's a false accusation. Um, but it's one, they're trying to get the interest of the Romans to, because they, they want the Romans What's to right, crucify why, why him. What a Roman, why, I mean, so, yeah. so what if he's the Jewish Messiah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't really, that, that was really a That was a threat to the Romans as well because, um, because the Romans considered their leader to be God and you weren't allowed to claim to be mm. like God and mm. to accept worship. So there was a bit of that. Um, I suppose that's why they've added well. in, he claims to be a Messiah, yep. a king. Yes, that's so, right. I.e., this is a threat to you yeah, yeah. in terms of your power and authority and so yeah. on in the land. I suppose it also raises the issue that if he wasn't actually the Messiah, then they'd completely justified in making these claims. But the problem comes in if, if he actually was. When you think about Jesus and his claim to me, be Messiah, if you read through the whole of all the Gospels, um, he was very careful about what he said about himself, uh, particularly publicly. And some people will say, well, where did he actually claim to be Messiah? Privately to his disciples, uh, he accepted their worship and, um, you know, he did claim to be Messiah. And whenever someone acknowledged him as that, uh, he, you know, he would accept that. Um, but he didn't walk around saying, I am God publicly. And I think well, that there were... Got him killed yeah, quickly. that would have got him killed. Um, so because he actually wanted to have a ministry, he wanted to do teaching and so on, he had to be careful about what he said. But also, um, a claim to be God would throw up in people's minds an image of Yahweh and the heaven, you know, the God who sits in heaven. And the idea of God the Son was something that he needed to teach people. And so, in, um, you know, in, in his teaching that comes through. Um, and that was why his language is a little bit different to the language that we use today. Well, let's now consider the trial itself. And uh, Kangaroo Court has been described as a, a mock court 
in which the principles of law and justice are disregarded or perverted. Now, I thought it would be appropriate to bring up an expert witness. So we've got uh, Ray Turns, he's a regular at our Logos Live events. He works as a professional lawyer. Um, maybe, Ray, what do you make of the trial of Jesus? Was proper legal protocol followed? Clearly it wasn't. Uh, I think you, you said kangaroo court, and I think Cam described it as a farce. I think a farce is pretty accurate. Yeah. I think kangaroo court is generous. Right, <laughs> okay. <laughs> why, 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 why generous? Well, uh, he's on trial for his life. He, he should have had a lawyer to start with. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you could recommend some, I suppose. Yes. <laughs> um, but also, he's actually found not guilty. <laughs> Yeah. Pontius Pilate comes back and say, I, I find this bloke not guilty of the charges. Mm. It's contrary to any known legal system that you punish someone when you've found them not guilty. Like, mm. It's just mm. wrong. I, I think this was trial by mob, yeah. not by a court. No, thanks very much, Ray. That's very helpful. Yes, yeah, like innocent, innocent, but I'll kill you for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah if, you, if you read the account, it, you know, he was declared innocent by Pilate. I find no basis for a charge against this man, he says. Yep. So, so if you like, that's kind of like the first little trial, and Jesus is found to be innocent. Then he sends him to, to Herod Antipas in Galilee, uh, who who uh, sends him back to Pilate. Pilate once again says, I can't find a reason. Um, the crowd ask him to release Barabbas, who was much more of a threat to the Romans than Jesus was. Uh, he was a violent revolutionary. Um, and in the end, he says, I, I found in him no grounds for the death penalty, but in the end, their shouts prevail. So the decision that Pilate makes is to pacify the crowd. It's not about justice. It's about being, allowing himself to be swayed by public opinion um, and his desire. The, these are people, these are his subjects. He wants to pacify them. So he does something that he, he knows is unjust. Would it be too cynical to suggest that he's a typical politician? <laughs> <laughs> he makes a political decision, that's for sure. This says so much about um, the value of a human life in the first century as well. Uh, the whole, the way the, the trials were conducted, the way that Jesus was mocked and not represented, no one really cared. But there's also a certain irony with this guy Barabbas, who's, they want him released, even though he's a known murderer and leader of an insurrection. Yes, so the one that was guilty is, is set, free, set free, and the one who was innocent is the one that is punished uh, for a crime that he didn't commit. Um, but there's an irony there too when we think about um, salvation and the story there, which is the story that um, we are the guilty and yet we are the ones that get to go free. This raises another question. As I mentioned before, if God is good and powerful, how could he let Jesus be condemned like this? Yeah, well, justice is an attribute of God. Like We, we read the word justice in the Bible more than a hundred times, particularly in the Old Testament. But... While we often think of justice as fairness, um, God's justice is always about what is right and it's also mixed in with his mercy. So sometimes justice leads to punishment and wrath, but other times mercy plays a significant role. So the prophecy about um, the coming salvation says, Zion will be redeemed with justice. So it's going to be redeemed. There'll be a redemption there. So mixed in with the idea of God is going to do what is right is that God will be merciful and that he will redeem and save. So what, he, what happens on the cross is God bringing about justice at personal expense. Like that is part of the Godhead that is, that is suffering on the cross. It's like God paid paid uh, for the crime that we committed. So yes, justice is served, um, sin is put to death, forgiveness is possible, and it's all done through God actually sacrificing part of himself That's on the cross. That's why it's so important that Jesus will, is actually God himself. So he does what needs to be done, but he does it in such a way that his mercy flows through to us, and we get what we don't deserve, we get forgiveness. Um, so I think the Book of Romans says that you know that that just at the right time, Jesus died for the ungodly. That's us. God giving His life for the ungodly, making it possible for us. As a parent, um, just harking back to my children, and you know they have this acute sense of fairness. But as a parent, I know like when I buy a child one thing and the other feels like they're unfairly done by. As a parent, buy them some snakes. Yeah, you you've, you've got a much bigger perspective. 
Um, you don't always do what they may perceive as exactly fair. You yeah. do what you know is right and what is loving. And I think in some cosmic scale, we see God doing that here. He does what is right. He deals with sin, with finality um, on the cross, um, but he does it in such a way that he draws us back you know, into his loving arms. Any of you want to have any questions or things that they'd like to ask? So it's big. Like, what, why, why did Jesus have to die? Why does Jesus have to die? Why couldn't God just say, it's okay? I think justice needed to be served. Um, I remember a preacher using this illustration of um, a, their child was killed by a drunk driver. This is the illustration. It didn't happen directly to the preacher. And uh, so a drunk driver kills their child. And, you know, can that person just forgive the criminal who's done that? You know, can you just write that off and go, oh, it's okay. I know you didn't mean to have those drinks. You know, like, there's, there's an, there is something innate and characteristic about us that says, no, justice must be served. And so when we, when we think about sin and our, our cosmic dilemma, justice needed to be served. God could only save us through nevertheless punishing sin. Um, so he's made a way possible for, uh, for you know, justice is served and we are able to be recon reconciled to him. So we're making this big leap between Jesus endured this trial, he was unfairly condemned and died on a cross, but actually that was God's plan all along. And Jesus prophesied about that. Like he, he says in, in the Gospel of Mark, it's recorded, he said, uh, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. Like he saw that he came, his whole reason for, for coming was in order to make that sacrifice. And perhaps that's why he goes like a lamb to the slaughter and doesn't use the powers that he has shown before that he has um, in order to stop this trial and its consequences. So today we've considered and reflected on the unjust trial and condemnation of Jesus. Mob rule, perhaps, where an innocent man is condemned. Which reminds us of the Logos for today, which is, What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Please thank our guest today, Reverend Tracy Larson.